Hey, how you doing? Justin here with another lockdown lesson. Today I've got a super special guest, top LA session cat. It's Mr. Tim Pierce. How you doing, Tim? I'm good. Bright and early over here. Not so bright and early where you are, but uh, it's working out. And I'm pretty sure the weather's not as nice easy either. It's a horrible <laughs> rain today. Okay, good. Well, it's yeah. a little. Had some... It's a little gray here. Yesterday was sunny, so it's up and down for us too. Yeah, I saw you had rain recently. That was a bit of a shocker. Which one? Yeah, which raindrop? <laughs> <laughs> we had three raindrops. Yeah. No, we had some beautiful storms this year. It, it was great. Uh -huh. We needed it, and uh, we're grateful for it. You know, we we love we love our storms because they really mean a lot to California. We need them. Oh, absolutely. Um, okay, so uh, for today, the the point of this kind of series is me asking guitar players that I love and respect to share some stuff that I love about them and for me to learn some stuff and then hopefully share it on YouTube for them to other people to enjoy as well. And the thing that you do that I've always enjoyed so much is this layering of guitar parts and being able to mix it's often parts that I might not have thought of and, and leaving big spaces in parts to fill up later. It's almost, I'm not sure if you're planning it. So how, how do you go about this wonderful layering? Well, I look, I look at a song like there are frequencies to fill. And if you do a part that's legato and clean, you might add another part that's more dirty and staccato. So if, if I'm playing a part that's... I might throw that down, and then underneath I'd end up going... And then I might, there might be room for one more thing that's way up high, which might be. Now I have a track up. Let me try and demonstrate that. But I need okay. to be able to see my Pro Tools, so I'm going to turn this laptop down a little bit. Let's see if I can demonstrate this. Okay. Here it comes. Here it comes. I promise you. One, two, three, four. Now I'm quickly going to add another part. And this will be a more rhythmic part. Huh? Now I have to turn down the first part. Balance is very important also, as is panning. Generally, I like to have guitar parts panned either all the way to the left or all the way to the right. That's kind of a traditional record-making yeah. thing from the way back in the past. But that leaves space right. for the vocal in the front. The, you know, a lot, the vocal can stay in the middle, and the guitar parts are per percolating on each side, and they stay out of the way. You can actually play more guitar if you actually pan everything all the way to the left and all the way to the right. Now, I actually am going to practice what I preach here, and both sounds are in stereo because I like stereo too. Now I'm going to pan everything. You'll be able to hear both parts better now. Check this out. Okay, before we talk again, let me just put that high part in too. Here we go. Anyway, that's three parts. You know, I could go on and on and on, but uh, I had a low rhythmic part that's more like a percussionist. I had a arpeggio that's kind of dreamy and legato. And then, but I, I'll just say it, I'm a little, gu a little guilty about it, but I'll just say it, it's the cold play kind of part. Uh, which is a descendant of the U2 edge part. You know, which is yeah, yeah. always works, especially up high. You know, a nice drone up high. Can't resist. Absolutely. So let's, let's, if you don't mind, I want to drill into each factor of this because there's more to it 
I think, that, that we can learn from. And the first one, let's talk about panning, as you mentioned it. Yes. So obviously if you've got two guitar parts, you can pan them left and right. Where are you putting the third one? Are you choosing a stable mate to go either left or right, or are you going halfway left, halfway right, or are you staying keeping one in the center? In this particular situation, I would have the high drone part on the same side as the percolating rhythm part. So, and that's just a choice based on in the moment you would go, oh, that sounds better here. That sounds better there. But the reason I say that is that they're super far apart. If the, if the percolating rhythm part down here, it's in a very low range. That way, I, if I play this up high, they're going to stay out of the way of each other, even though they're in the same speaker. So then I, this would be the one that's, that's by itself on one side. However, okay. your question brings up a good point. I might actually put one of them in the center. <laughs> so it would have to share space with the vocalist and the snare drum and everything else that's in the center. So, and, yeah, but yeah. you know, when I deliver parts to people, it's up to them. They, they, they're pretty ruthless about where they put stuff. They might turn off one of the parts, but yeah. generally, let's say I'm doing four guitar parts. I'd have two on the left and two on the right. And I would just make sure to coming out of each speaker, they were different enough or spread frequency-wise enough apart that when they're coming out of the same speaker, they would be low and high, low and high. So that's how I would solve that. You, you never use the half right, half left kind of thing. You're either one side or the other or the middle. <laughs> yeah, I have to say, I never, when somebody goes like here, you know, at three o'clock or six o'clock, I I just, it's just an old school thing. I just love, mm -hmm. you, you put on headphones, you hear a guitar play over here, you get, hear a guitar play over here, another guitar, another guitar. I like for the guitars to be side to side. Now, if, if there's a really, really featured part, it can come out front and center and take over the whole thing. You know, it can be stereo even. But I like hard left and right panning. It's totally old school. I think the, even the old mixers only had center or left and right. Some of, a lot of the old panning pots from way back. Lost the... So if it's all right, Tim, I'd like to go into a little bit more detail about some of those points. Uh, and let's start with panning, because you mentioned that already. Uh, you said that you tend to go hard left or right or center. You never use those like 60, 30 half panning things. And what are the rules as to what goes where? I guess for me, the excitement of putting on a pair of headphones and hearing one guitar player on the left and one on the right, or Hendrix on the left or Hen and Hendrix on the right, or John Mayer on the left and John Mayer number two on the right, it just sounds the best to me to hear the, the guitars, you know, isolated in each ear. Now, that being said, if you listen to like a U2 record or something, you're going to hear panning all across the spectrum. If a part is featured and has effects, it's great to put that in the center, too. But generally, yes, I love hard left and right, especially when you put on headphones. And you can actually do more guitar parts if you do hard left and right because they stay out of the way of the vocal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You definitely don't want to interfere with the voice, right? Always, because I spent my whole life playing on songs. And it's always, uh, you're always orchestrating around a lead vocal and a lyric and a melody. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So uh, what, what determines what ones might go together? If, if you've got, more, let's say you've got three parts or four parts after you've gone one left and one right, where is number three going? In the middle or, or to the left or to the right? Or how are you well, choosing where he's going to go? Well, the simplest answer is that if it's a low rhythm part, like I demonstrated, then the high drone part might be able to be its neighbor in one speaker because they're frequency wise so far apart. So that's the simple answer. The low rhythm that's staccato would work with the high drone that's legato coming out of one side because they're so far apart frequency wise and even style wise. That's that's the mm. simplest answer. But you would have to experiment do, and see what you like. Do, do you ever get in there and do chopping of frequencies or do you leave that to an engineer? Do you go, well, I want this one to be like boosty around 2K, 4K or something so it pokes out and then cut that frequency from another part or that's for the engineer? Well, that's for whoever's mixing the song. What I do is I give them sounds that are too big and too fat all the time. And they generally, like Chris Lord Algae, if he gets it, anybody who gets the actual parts, guitar parts, they scoop out bottom end. And that fat bottom end is what I crave. So I always deliver things really big. And generally what happens is they always take away bottom end to make more room for the drums and bass. So I don't worry about that stuff. I just want everything to be fat. <laughs> okay. So you're much more concerned with, well, you must be giving thought to the way the sounds are going to work together, right? Like you, you wouldn't want the same sound in all of those three places. No, so no. Yeah. Are you, are you, you're 
looking to each sound to be as good as it can be or you're staying aware like oh, I don't want too much middle here because I want to give the middle to that other guy it's not really for, it, it, I don't really talk think about middle I think about um, if you're talking about EQ middle I don't think about that I think about frequency wise low middle and high maybe on the neck I mean it's really that simple like if I play something down here there is space for something up here at fret nine, and then there's space for something here at fret 14. It's really that practical. Now, all those sounds are probably gonna have too much bottom end because I like the way things sound fat, but I'll turn them down, and I think they're really, really sounding great, but generally when you give it to a really great mixer, they will take away bottom end. It's pretty uh, pretty universal. Okay, and how do you, then do you, uh, what's the process for for somebody who's new to this idea of layering, how how should they approach it? Other than it being a low, middle, and a high, are there any other things, suggestions for starting points for things like, is it? Would you usually start with a kind of a chuggy part and then a, a, an arpeggiated part? And a, is there well, any decision you the, make like that, you're going to reverse depending on the song. So you have to be light on your mm -hmm. feet. I will say this though: cleaner sounds are better these days. Cleaner sounds sound more modern these days. So I would say. Try and do as many cleaner sounds as you can. Save one distorted part, you know, just maybe one distorted part and three clean sounds. Also, effects are great if they're in the DAW. That way you can take them away and add more of them. They're always negotiable. So if you print your effects, they're with you forever. So with delays, I love them when they stay in the DAW so that I can actually dry it up. I would say just go cleaner and use effects that you can change later. Mm. Do you, when you give stems to people, to a producer, do you leave the effects on or do you take them off? I give them with the effects on uh, because I generally don't know what's going to happen down the line. So we're talking about two different things. If it's for me, I, I keep the effects negotiable all the time. If it's for a client, mm -hmm. I deliver with the effects so that they don't have to worry about it or think about it. With one exception, if I'm playing a guitar solo for a client, I give them... Uh, I just I give it to them dry, and that that way they can dry it up later. Because solos, I don't want them to be stuck with delays on a solo. So that's the one place where I'll give it to them dry, and they'll have to add their own delay. Hmm. Okay, Doki. Um, obviously, it, it's going to depend on the song a lot. But are there uh, particular grips or style ways of looking at grips that you found effective in this layering? Obviously, like the the the, the chordy part is going to be probably a bar chord or a power chordy kind of thing or a riff low down. When you get into the chord part, are you generally working with triads, sus chords, anything that goes. Is there is there any for somebody new to this? What would you recommend they start exploring? Yeah, we can do a rule of thumb thing. So let's say the low part is this, but I'm going to take my own advice. I'm going to clean it up. He said, I, I have five yeah. overdrive pedals in a row, so sometimes I don't know which ones are on or not. <laughs> I'm going to turn down the amp and clean it up. So let's say the low yeah. part is this. Still has some drive to it, but it's on the cleaner side. Okay, so then what would be nice with that? Just exactly what you said. A three note arpeggio, let's say that's more like the Beatles. Those two parts will stay out of the way of each other. Maybe I'll even mute this part and it'll stay out of the way more even. And in fact, a part like that might even disappear. Maybe that part is a double of the bass part. Which leaves even more space. Okay, so then my, my arpeggio, exactly what you said. Maybe it's just two notes. Then I've left room for this. I've also left room for this. Hmm. So that's just a quick and dirty, I never say quick and dirty, but it's, it applies to this. That's just a very quick way to kind of describe how you can do four guitar parts at the same time and they'll all stay out of the way of each other. They'll all interlock. It's basically orchestration at that point. Okay, so we've got, to separate our parts, we've got uh, panning, so left and right, and within different frequency spectrum. So we've got like low, middle, and high, maybe some in between as well. 
The other part to that was the rhythmic elements. Exactly. So we've got these like e even rhythms. We've got uh, uh, like a, a, where there's a specific groove. We've got these textural kind of slow arpeggio pieces that are not really rhythmic but creating an atmosphere. We've got highly rhythmic funky sort of lines like that third one that you gave us there. And then we've got the, the cold play effect, <laughs> which is just quarter notes or eighth notes, right? Is that, is that a good kind of summary of the... It's really good, but I can even do better than that. If you can just imagine your favorite bands, like a band like The Killers. Remember The Killers? Mm -hmm. they, that's guitar orchestration in, in an amazing way. I mean, they're as good at orchestrating guitar as U2 is. The Killers are amazing, or that band Phoenix. I mean, there, there are not a lot of new bands that are orchestrating guitars because guitar is more of a seasoning. It's, it used to be the engine behind music. Now it's more of a seasoning. So you might just hear one or two guitar parts now. But all you have to do is imagine your favorite band from any decade and one of those guitar parts, and that can be your guide. You know, maybe it's the Smiths. Uh, you know, maybe it's the Fray. Maybe it's a guitar part you heard on... Uh, a Bruno Mars song. Maybe it's a guitar part you heard on a, you know, that Niall Rogers played. All I'm saying is you don't have to look at it like frequency. You can literally look at it like, oh, I want a Niall Rogers part. You know, and then maybe along with that, there should be a, you know, surf part. <laughs> dump a bunch of reverb so all you have to do is imagine your favorite genres of music of all time or your favorite artists or your favorite records and you can choose parts based on that and generally these days uh you might you might have two really strong parts you might have Nile rogers up here and then mr surf down here And then at that point, there might only be room for an ambient part. So if I turn on my ambient delay, you could do something like this. So it might only be three parts. I think the modern approach is three parts rather than eight parts. You know, uh, it used to be, I used to just fill up tracks with tons of guitar parts. But these days, you really three strong parts and you, you can fill out a, you know, fill out a song really nicely. Do, do you include acoustic guitar parts, that kind of acoustic guitar where you get the, like a, in the chorus where it's kind of a percussion. It's like a hi-hat almost. Absolutely. The harmonies almost. Yeah. yeah and that, which we haven't talked about yet, that the great thing about acoustics is they sound amazing doubled. And we're back to this incredible left and right experience. So if I take an acoustic guitar and I double it, I play just brush strokes. It's just like this. <laughs> Let me turn off some of my, my surf effect there. <laughs> Do that on acoustic. Double it exactly. Pan them left and right. And they'll stay out of the way of those three electric parts I just demonstrated. Now, here's my best trick with acoustic. I still rush after so many decades of, de decades of playing. I always rush on acoustic at first. So I'll play a guitar, uh, an acoustic part on the left, I'll play one on the right, and I'll realize that the one I just played on the right is more laid back. And then I go to re-record the left one, that's even more laid back. Sometimes I'll bounce back and forth <laughs> three or four times, and my pocket gets better and better. So what, what I'm saying is I'll play the first one, and then I'll play the second one, I'll go, oh, that guy on the left is rushing, <laughs> okay? And so the left one is more laid back, and then I'll replace the first guy, and, and I'll go, oh, that guy on the right is rushing. and the parts end up pocketing and leaning back. Sometimes I have to I, I have to play it four times, and then it's just perfect. Oh. So you know that's a nice idea. Yeah, it works. It really works. Yeah, it's fine. You still feel like you rush after all of these. I not only that, feel like it. I mean, there's nothing wrong as a guitar player if you don't rush. You kind of sound boring. It's just part of what we are and what we do. So uh, you got to be able to do both. But and you can always see it on the grid. But yeah, I do. I still play ahead of the beat. Absolutely. Oh.
Yes, I always beat myself up over that. that that's one of the, like, I record it and I'm like, that's, I can't, I can't be doing that, you know. I'm here to tell you I still do it, but it's not a bad thing. That's, that's part of the excitement of when you hear a guitar part. It's, you know, if it's, it, maybe it always shouldn't be ahead of the beat, but a lot of guitar parts are great because they're right on the beat. Uh huh. Hmm. Good to be able right. to lay it back, though. You need to be able to to have that in your toolbox to be able to go. Oh, that would feel better if I laid it back. And that's the great thing about our DAWs. You can see actually. And I generally there might be one stroke that's rushed, and I'll I'll move it back in the DAW. You know, <laughs> we all do it. Yeah. There's little. There's definitely no sense in ruining a, a a whole good take over one little fluff. I think, especially not these days. I mean, we did that when we were working on analog machines. We used to punch in mistakes or phrases or whatever, and it was pretty hairy because it was destructive recording. These days, there's no reason not to fix the ending of a solo. You know, you play a solo. The last bar is not what you want. Fix the last bar. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're doing plenty of live music. You know, it's it, it's okay to to fix mistakes. I mean, the th that's yeah. the thing about guitar is that you want to reach. You really want to push it so that you do make mistakes, so that you get all the all the enthusiasm, the excitement. Guitar, you know, you want to you want to push the envelope. You don't want to sound safe. You know. Yeah, so I've I've always used that as a good excuse for playing lots of bad notes. But <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> but, it's harder for a drummer because yeah. the drummer they need to lay it down and get it done. You know, but mm -hmm. for us. We can actually afford to be kind of out of control. In fact, people want us to be out of control. They really do. Yeah. It's it's what I love most about Jeff Beck is that he always feels like he's about to fall off. Like, is he going to make it? Is he going to make it? And he nearly always does. But I have heard a couple of occasions where he's really stretched out and it's just kind of fizzled a bit and just gone. You can see he's gone, oh, well, that didn't work. But then he's just straight back on it with another yeah. even better idea to yeah. fizz out of it. Yeah. It's fine. That's, that's what people, people um, love that. Okay, another question for you that uh, I'm sure a lot of people wonder about, the, uh, the U2 Coldplay thing. How do we choose the two notes that are going to go throughout that section? Because it nearly always is two notes that you just bounce between and they fit for the whole thing. Um, what's, it, what's the trick? It depends, but if, as a general rule, it's the one and the five. So the tonic. Mm -hmm. So let me pick, a, pick, let me pick the key of E. So I'll, I'll go here, key of E. Every chord in the key of E diatonically will work over that, you know. Even the diminished chord. So mm -hmm. a one and a five will always work. Now, the great thing is when you start adding color, that might be a suspension, a four. And then you might resolve that to the three. And then if you shift positions, it can get more interesting. You can work in a, a little melody, a motif. This is just two octaves with a melody happening in the center. Right? And then when it goes to the five chord, you might have to make a change. You might have to go... So we might, the whole song, you could play the whole chorus or whatever part you're playing. You might have to change in one spot, or you might have to change if it goes to a D chord. But generally, I mean, there is an answer to your question that's very simple. It's the root and the fifth. Yes. Mm -hmm. Those are probably the easiest is it ones. That I uh, I tried to answer that question a little while ago. The root and the fifth do, it does work through the whole thing. The ones that I tended to like have these weird dissonances yes, in them as well. Yes, so you quite yes. often get ones that are, that are like a, yeah. a, a a tone apart. So you might have like an E and a D or something like that totally, where you yeah. get this little clash. Yeah. And I was trying to figure out an answer as to what was the right one. But the only answer I could come up with was muck around until I found one that sounded now good. Now you froze. Because that tends to be, oh. Yeah, you, you were trying to back? figure out, it's just start again with, I was trying to figure out an answer to what was the right one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I was trying to work out 
if there was a some sort of theory reason why some of the notes had worked. But the, the best I came up with in the end was exploring it and mucking around until I stumbled upon ones that sounded good. Because then I ended up finding ones that were maybe not the standard one that everyone else had done before, but still had some little quirky stuff. And I think people are afraid of that often, that they want to have a rule. But then sometimes there isn't one. It's just muck about until you find something. Well, yes. And the thing is, take some time. Take a half hour if you want and keep searching for the good one, like this one, the edge. <laughs> I mean, that's what you're talking about. That's the major seven. That's the total dissonant interval. It's, it seems like the, the modern approach, it's, it's kind of like you 2 went into Coldplay, but it moved into this other, yeah. some of the young guys seem to be a bit less uh, ref, uh, confined and just gone, well, I'm just going to pick these notes. And you go, whoa, hang on, that's a bit pokey. But then they move it and resolve things. And Yeah, guitar is always best much. when it's not predictable, when it's, you know, spontaneous, you know, that's our world. Our world is surprise, basically. It's good to be surprising mm. as a guitar player, if you can. Take risks. Oh. So what other, what, what other tips have you got for people getting into their layering then? When they, if somebody's just starting out for it, we've, I think we've get, got a really solid foundation with the, the, uh, the panning and the frequencies and the different rhythmic types. We've <clears> explored <throat> grooves and doubling the bass thing and this, the, the Coldplay trick. What other things are there that you recommend people get into? Uh, okay, so there was a sound on the Line 6 pod called Matchless DC30, and we used to use the pod for all our direct sounds. And the point I'm trying to make with this, there was an XTC record where they used that preset on the entire record. Find in your whatever you're using to create your sound, and for a lot of people it's a modeler, find a Vox style of sound, because that's going to be basically the template for all good guitar sounds. You, Marshalls are pretty distorted, like Fenders are pretty clean, but if you get a Vox style sound where there's a little bit of gain and it's fat and it kind of compresses itself, all your sounds can come from that one preset. So don't waste a lot of time searching for a JCM 800. Just use the Vox and maybe put a pedal in front of it or distort it a little bit. So that's the world I live in, half distorted sounds, sounds that read as clean, but because the amp is cranked up or the modeler amp, whatever you're using, it's cranked up and it sounds like a Vox where the notes begin to compress themselves naturally because of the gain. Just stay there and use that for all your sounds. So don't search constantly. Don't scroll through amp tones. Find one that works best for you and use that. Now, the next thing I would say is this, and I'm, I'm doing a video on this right now. Don't pick too hard. Turn your, you turn your guitar up in the mix to where it's kind of shockingly loud, play lightly and you'll get a fatter tone. That's the paradox. If you hit the guitar really hard and you're not loud enough in the track, it's gonna sound really thin and you're gonna hit the top end of what the guitar is putting out. Turn yourself up in the mix, play very lightly and you'll find the notes get really huge. Now the danger in that, if you don't hear the drums well enough, you're likely to rush. You need to find the spot where you're up loud enough to where you can play lightly, pick lightly, and this is a good thing to practice too because it gives you more yeah. control. But you want to be able to hear the drums so you don't rush ahead. These are things wow. that will make you sound better instantly. And sometimes they're things that you don't learn for a number of years. And, and the, other, the other thing, make sure you have a guitar that plays in tune. If you have a Gibson, like you and I are both playing guitars right now, you have a straight string pull, you have a six in line uh, headstock there, that guitar stays mm -hmm. in tune. This guitar stays in tune because it's got a Floyd Rose on it. If you have a Gibson or an Epiphone and it's got that traditional headstock where they go like this, you're, it's hard to keep the G string in tune. You'll be frustrated all the time. And as you overdub and as you layer, you're gonna have the out of tuneness kind of compound itself. So whatever, you guitar, whatever guitar you have in your studio that plays most in tune, don't be afraid to use that for everything when you're recording. Hmm, that's an interesting one. I, I, so actually, this that that was going to be should have been something we talked about with the layers. You don't tend to swap guitars for the different layers to get. Uh, I just had a, an interesting chat with this guy Chris from the Cold Stairs, 
uh, the kind of a riffy thing. And he talks about when he records his different riff parts, he thinks of them as different people. So he'll go in and do, well, here's my riff one. I'm going to use this guitar and I'm going to pretend to be, you know, a uh, quiet, lonely riff man who's a bit shy and sits at the back, like Malcolm Young or whatever, you know. And then, but then he, when he's doing another part, he'll use a different guitar with a different sound and pretend to be another guy just to be able to kind of get these, a little bit of that band magic, but when you're own still. That is really the the right advice. But for me, I had to deliver my parts in seconds to clients. My mm-hmm. job was getting stuff done Stuff that might take somebody 10 hours, I had to do in 10 minutes, and I'm not exaggerating. So uh, often it was oh. better for me to have the same guitar in my hands and just tweak it and change change the little stuff on the fly. Because for me, in, in the job I've done for 40 years as a studio musician, anything that breaks up the momentum, people start to lose interest. It's So you have to balance the idea of... Your friend is absolutely right, and I agree with him. If you pick up an old Gretsch and you tune it up, do whatever it takes to get it going, play the part on that, walk away, put it down, grab your Strat, play the Nile Rodgers part on that, that is the best world. But the world I always lived in was one of high momentum and high pressure. So uh, I had to get it done. I, uh, nobody gave me any time to get a sound. I had to get my parts done absolutely instantly. And Wow. It's it's so the, the, you have to look at both things. If if you're doing stuff that's breaking your momentum, if it takes you two hours to do your guitar parts, you're going to be in a different mood two hours down the road. If you can get those guitar parts down very quickly, sometimes it's better. So you have to weigh. I mean, the thing I would say is if you put three guitar parts down with one guitar, go back and replace replace one of them with the Gretsch. You know, hmm. I just I know. I know how important momentum is, and if you keep the guitar in your hands, the same guitar, you can keep the maximum momentum. That being said, your friend is absolutely right. Different guitars have different sonic frequencies. It will be more interesting. And the big records that we love, they were done that way, where they they changed the amps and the guitars on every part. You know, you just you worked really hard on that stuff. But a lot of those records were done over days and days. So I think you get what oh, I'm months. saying. I was, I was, yeah, yeah, yeah. my job was to give people stuff immediately. And sometimes that meant just keeping the same guitar and changing tones within that realm. Now, I'm going to ask just as a fanboy here, was the, the Crowded House sessions, that kind of thing? Were they, were they, uh, 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 here's some stuff you got to play on it right now, or was that a more relaxed affair? It was not relaxed at all. It, 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 my job, even back then, was we want it now. That's why you've been hired. If you don't give it to us now, we're going to doubt you. We're going to doubt the situation. I can't stress enough, you know, professional recording situations, you do it now, or you, you live or die by doing it now. See, that's what I'm saying. If you're by yourself or you're with your bandmates and you can take a day and, and, and a horse around and experiment, that's great. But I started my job even back then. I was hired to come in, and it had to be right the minute I sat down and played it. Wow. That was the first take. That thing you're talking about, that was the first take. So, Or, you know, it was one of the first takes. So Now, the band had rehearsed all that stuff, so they they were on the other side of that equation. But (laughs) me, as the ringer who was brought into that, you know, they they don't want to, you know, there could be no doubt. Wow. I, I couldn't handle that kind of pressure. I, don't think. I couldn't either. I, I, and I'm uh, glad I don't do it as much these <laughs> days, but I, I pretended to be able to handle it. You know, it's, it is high yeah. pressure. It really is. Wow. But I've said, I've seen you, I've had the pl- privilege of watching you work on a session for Rick and you did do things very quickly. It's, you went, here's this track. What do you think? Do you like that? Okay. Let's do this other one. Bang. Okay. Well, I think we need a little bit up here. And you were, I was like, whoa, there were, there weren't, I don't think you did a second take of anything. No, that's because Rick, if it doesn't work the first time, he loses interest and, and it's like, okay, we're out of here. Thanks. Or that part doesn't work. You got anything else? I mean, he's one of those guys that if it, if he doesn't hear it happen immediately, he moves on and moving on might be him driving away. <laughs> wow. Well, well, he's, yeah. Guys, I really hope you enjoyed this session with Tim. My daughter's just started knocking on the studio door, so I have to wrap up a bit here. Uh, Tim, it's been amazing. We could have kept going like this for hours. I really appreciate your time. Uh, make sure you go and check out Tim's website. He's got some awesome lessons there that I know you're going to love. So uh, we'll see you for more very soon. Thanks again, Tim. I can't wait. Let's do it again soon, please. Let's, I felt like we were just getting started. Awesome, man. See ya. Wicked. Okay.